Okay, good morning again, everybody. My name is Ed Flossie, and I am the Director of Training at SST, which is the company that provides ShotSpotter for you. Today's webinar is going to be a real quick overview on some follow-up investigation strategies that you may or may not be employing at your agency. If you are, uh, perfect. If you are not, something to consider. I know that it's not a one-size-fits-all. Uh, there are some strategies that may not work for your agency, and if that's the case, that's the case. So let's get on with the actual presentation. Uh, just so you know, everybody that is on the webinar currently is being muted and that's to reduce the background noise for everybody so that it's easier for people to hear. If you do have a question, please hold that question until the end of the webinar and I can unmute you or you can simply uh, type your question in the chat comment box on the webinar tool at any time and that will show me that you have a question. Uh, there also should be a little hand icon on your tool. What that does is it raises your hand so that I know that you have a question that I can address by unmuting you or we can talk through the chat feature. Most agencies are doing a thorough neighborhood canvas on homicides or when somebody gets hit with a round. What we suggest and that some of our agencies are doing now is to do a neighborhood canvas if time allows and if it's appropriate. I mean, if it's 4 o'clock in the morning and everybody's lights are off in the homes, probably would not be appropriate to do a, a full neighborhood canvas because you're just going to make people angry. But after the scene is secure, a neighborhood canvas can be effective in gaining intel about the shooting. Uh, we know for sure that not all gunshots are being called in and that really approximately 20 to 25 percent, sometimes even lower depending on the jurisdiction, are actually being reported due to the several reasons that we all know. People become apathetic to the gunfire in their neighborhood, uh, their fear of retaliation from the bad guys that are doing the shooting, uh, it's somebody else's responsibility to call, and then the most common one, well, somebody else will call or they're just not sure what it is and they don't want to call it in because they're not sure what it is. Another benefit to these neighborhood can canvases on all alerts is it's really a community building tool. Uh, the community sees that the agency is doing something about the gunfire alert. Uh, they obviously live in the neighborhood, they're obviously hearing it, and there's a false perception out there that the agency knows everything and that they know about these gunshots, but they just don't care. Uh, they'd rather hang out at Starbucks or wherever their local place is. So by going out and doing these neighborhood canvases on all alerts, it gives a chance to let folks see us in a different way. Uh, it's We're not the officer coming to arrest them anymore unless they happen to be the ones that are the shooters. Um, it builds that trust that could pay off big in the future. Uh, by building this trust with a neighborhood, you never know what kind of dividends that will pay out in the future. Uh, I know when I was on the job, we had plenty of times where people, they liked us because we spent time talking to us, and, or we, we spent time talking to them, and they gave us information that we would have never known about. And it also gives us an opportunity to chat with folks about other topics. Uh, while you have them there, have you noticed any kind of other strange activity in the neighborhood? Do you have any other kind of issues that you would like the police department or sheriff's office to look into? Door hangers. We all know that some people won't answer their doors to a uniformed person uh, because they're afraid that they don't want to be seen talking to the police. So they may not answer the door and some people may not be home during the canvas. They may have been home during the actual shooting, but they may have taken off 
or falling asleep or something that they don't answer the door, but they could still provide valuable intelligence for us. One of our agencies, uh, East Palo Alto Police Department in California, uh, developed this door hanger system where they have a door hanger that they can leave at these doors that were unanswered so that the person can call in later. Uh, maybe they are inside, they don't want to talk to the uniformed person, but now they have a phone number that they can actually call in and talk more securely uh, when they can. This is an example of the door hanger that East Palo Alto developed. And if you'd like a copy of this, please let me know. Uh, toward the end of the presentation, I'll have my email address on the screen. Please feel free to shoot me an email, say, hey, Ed, I want A, B, C, D, and I will get back to you as soon as I possibly can with it. You can see here that there's three on a single sheet and that was done just to conserve paper. Uh, they printed it out so that they could cut it and they can have several door hanger type of devices from a single sheet of paper. Knowing your cameras in the coverage area can be huge. Uh, you never know where the suspect's going to appear just before or just after the shooting on camera. Uh, we've had several cases where a person was caught on camera inside a mom and pop shop uh, just before the shooting in the neighborhood, getting a little bit of liquid courage to go out and do his deeds. And the witnesses at the scene don't know a name. They don't really have a good description other than a clothing description. Officers go back to the stores in the neighborhood, look at surveillance tape, and find a person matching that clothing description. Now they have a picture of dude's face. You can also check the cameras in the area for the ingress and egress paths to the alerts for the suspect and or vehicles. Remember that our shot spotter alerts, the sensors can articulate direction of travel and speed. So that could be important knowing which direction the shooter is going to check for vehicles on the way out. Maybe you'll pick up a suspect vehicle description. Two types of cameras to be aware of. Obviously agency cameras for those of you who have pan tilt zoom surveillance cameras. Uh, we do work with camera vendors. We don't do cameras. I, I know a lot of people believe that, but ShotSpotter does not do cameras. We will work with camera vendors to be able to provide those camera systems with a Latin long so they can turn toward the alert uh, when the alert is published. Also too, if the agencies have control, say they have somebody in a op center that can pan, tilt, zoom the camera on their own, then they can start looking for those exit or escape routes as well. Uh, red light and traffic cameras, commonly these people are in a hurry to leave the scene. So if you have red light or speed cameras in the neighborhood or in the coverage area, uh, be sure to check those. And then privately owned cameras. Again, we talked about the person uh, inside the store buying a beer to go out and do his deeds. So check the local stores and know where the parking lot security cameras are for businesses or yard view security cameras for residents. Uh, we've had some luck with that as well where a resident had a camera focused on their front yard, uh, just a security type of camera, and actually caught a shooting inside a, the victims were inside a vehicle. Suspects walked up to the vehicle, parked on the curb, and shot into the car, and it was all caught on a residential security camera. So knowing these cameras in the coverage area can be critical to your investigation. Metal detectors. Uh, one of our agencies is currently exploring these handheld metal detectors, uh, not for every single car in the agency, but for selected cars, could be supervisor cars or if you have evidence tech cars, to go out and scan the area with a metal detector specifically for shell casings. Uh, we all know how small those shell casings can be, and if you're in deep brush or you're in some kind of terrain where they're not easily seen, the metal detector can help you uh, collect a lot more casings. 
infrared devices. There's a couple out there that you might be interested in. Uh, we've got the dedicated handheld devices, such as the one to the right, the green handheld. And then there's new ones that you can actually attach to smartphones. And these would also be good to help locate possibly shell casings. The shell casings, depending on the climate, may have cooled down significantly by the time you get out and secure the scene and get the infrared device out. So shell casings may not show up as well, but the handgun certainly will. The gun should still be warm enough, or at least victims uh, in the area. We suggest that you go out to 25 meters, of course, but if you use the infrared device, within the perimeter to look outside that 25 meter perimeter, you might find something just outside there that could be helpful for your investigation or maybe even a victim who was shot at the location but had stumbled out and no real visible blood trail or any kind of evidence to lead you to that other victim could help find somebody. Explosive canines, uh, being a prior canine handler, uh, these are near and dear to my heart. These dogs are amazing. They can quickly find discarded firearms, shell casings in the area uh, well outside the 25 meter, especially if they get on scent and they start following a person's scent trail out of the 25 meter area, they can still find things along the way. Um, that would be obviously some a dog who is trained to track and explosives. but something that you could do. I do see that there's a question coming up. I'm going to stand by for this question. Oh, it's just a request for a recording. Uh, I am recording this uh, presentation, just so you know. Hopefully, uh, I'll be able to extract it and uh, get it back into a form that I could send it out to you guys in. And that could be another thing you could request is a recording of this. Uh, partnership with the ATF and specifically uh, their NIBIN uh, service. Uh, as we can see, there are plenty of things that the agency can do to increase your collection of shell casings. and. What we suggest that agencies do, and some of our agencies are already doing this, uh, Denver PD recently came on board and they are aggressively collecting shell casings from all alert scenes, no matter what type of crime. Some agencies ha in the past, uh, and I know we were guilty of it at my agency as well, where unless somebody was shot really or you know there's some kind of major damage done shell casings weren't a priority for us but what we suggest nowadays especially with NIBIN and what they're doing now is collect all casings from all scenes no matter what type of crime and then submit them through NIBIN because you never know what they'll link to there's a story uh, that just came out of Denver uh, I just picked it up this morning and the link is down at the bottom of the slide. It, I tried playing it once, and it plays well on my computer, but because of the bandwidth issue on the webinar, it won't play very well for you guys. So I'm going to leave it up there for a minute so you can copy down the URL and maybe play it later on if you want. Or you could just probably Google uh, Denver PD man linked to three shooting in two days, including dog and you'll probably find it that way too. Uh, what happened in this case, as was what happens in a lot of the NIBIN type of solves, is this idiot goes out and does two separate shootings, uh, burglaries and just shooting at people and homes and dogs. He escapes and at the scene, the officers collect shell casings. And they collect shell casings at scene number one, and they collect shell casings at scene number two. Well, at scene number three, uh, he is actually identified and eventually arrested, and shell casings are collected. They are able to take the shell casings from scene number three, 
go back and match them to scenes one and two. So rather than one charge, one solid charge on this guy, now they have three solid charges and show a pattern of violence that can hopefully put the suspect away for several years. Uh, another one that, another story I can quickly relate to you was given to me by John Reisenhoover. He was with the ATF and was running the NIBIN program for a little while. Uh, an officer was, was shot and killed and there were no witnesses to the killing, but there were shell casings. The shell casings were submitted to NIBIN. Those were matched back to a shooting incident where a stop sign was shot up. Uh, the only crime here was a uh, killing of a, shop, a stop sign. They matched those two casings, these two events, and went back to the area of the stop sign, started talking to neighborhood folks out there, and eventually one of them was able to give them information on who shot the stop sign. Now they have a suspect. They were able to work those leads and actually end out identifying the person who shot and killed the officer. So this idea of collecting all shell casings is huge. You never know what they'll link to in the long run. And if you have any questions about ATF or NIBIN, uh, there are two people working for SST now that used to work for uh, the ATF. And they are very, very knowledgeable, and they can get you squared away with the ATF and NIBIN very, very quickly. That would be another thing you can ask me for is their contact information. I'd be happy to give it to you. This is my, uh, my name, and there's my email address. Uh, please feel free to shoot me an email asking for, you can ask for any of the information that we had on the presentation, uh, the, a copy of the door hangers. Uh, I can actually, if you want to, send me an email, and I'll shoot you that URL to the Denver story so you don't have to go trying to Google it, or just anything else that you want from me. I'm going to leave that up there for a little while, and I'm going to check to see if there were any questions. Uh, it doesn't look like there's any questions pending. No, I don't see any questions pending. Um, if somebody does have a question, Please let me know now so that I can unmute you and we can ask the question. If you, if you do have a question, just click on the, the little hand uh, icon and I'll unmute you temporarily so you can ask your question and everybody will be able to hear it. And this is when we play the theme song for Jeopardy. It doesn't appear that there's any, going to be any questions. So, again, my email address is on the screen. If you think of a question later on, please feel free to email me, and I will get you the answer or get you to the right person for that answer. Uh, thank you for your time. It is about 20 minutes after the hour now, and since there are no questions, I am going to go ahead and end the webinar. Thank you for attending. And be safe. Catch lots of bad guys with guns. Thanks.